Let's talk artifacts in Mythic Odysseys of Theros. There are five, from what I'm being told, are probably the five major gods. That's what I've seen through some of the comments for folks who are better knowledgeable about Magic the Gathering lore than I am. So there are five major artifact weapons that all have cool stuff, and they tie into the piety score that we mentioned in the other video. So if you want to see what those are, stay tuned. As a wise man once said, if someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. What's going on, folks? Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and let's jump over to D&D Beyond and take a look. So first up is Akmon, the Hammer of Perforos. I believe he is the Forge Master God, so he is basically your Hephaestus, if you will. Uh, and what do you get when you wield his hammer? A plus three Warhammer. All right, makes sense. Uh, and when you make a hit with it, you deal an extra 3d10 fire damage. Uh, so that's just base. You get that no matter what. It does require attunement. It is an artifact. Um, if you are a worshiper of Perforos, you gain all of the following benefits for which you have piety, right? If you have a piety score of 10 plus, you get a randomly determined minor beneficial property. 25 plus, a randomly determined major beneficial property. And at 50 plus, an additional randomly determined major beneficial property. If you aren't a worshiper of Perforos, the hammer has two randomly determined detrimental or minor detrimental properties. This is covered in the artifacts section of the Dungeon Master's Guide in the, the magic item section. Additionally, while holding the hammer, you have resistance to fire damage and are immune to exhaustion. Additionally to that, you have proficiency with Smith's tools and advantage on any ability checks you make with them. While it is on your person, you can cast the following spells with DC 18. Animate objects, heat, metal, fabricate, magic weapon, mending, and shatter. Once you use the hammer to cast a spell, it can't be used to cast that spell again until the next dusk, which is an interesting concept. You don't see that too often. And then there are sections here about destroying the hammer. To destroy it, it must be taken to the realm of Tizerus in the underworld. I guess that's like Hades. Uh, there must be coated in the clay from the mire of punishment. The heat of the hammer hardens the clay, which fuses it to, uh, fuses to it after one month. Once fully hardened, the clay-covered hammer must be swallowed and digested by a kraken. Good luck dealing all of that nonsense. I guess this might be sort of like if you're maybe because I'm assuming Perforos is a good god. Uh, like I, I'm guessing. Uh, so this might be like an evil god's mission is to destroy the hammer and you got to do all these things. It's cool that they came up with rules for it. Um, it's definitely a badass weapon, right? For sure. Um, right? If you could be, I can easily see, right? You being the uh, the Perforos Forge Cleric uh, with some other good, like with a anvil wrought supernatural gift. So you're like, you're basically a Warforge. You get that molten skin armor. You have this badass hammer because you're pious to this. Like, there's a lot of stacks of things that can happen. The only downside is I think one of Perforos is it, maybe it's either Perforos or Heliod gives you um, fire resistance, and then like so does the hammer. So if like they gave you the same thing, it kind of doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, I also don't know the ways in which you would typically gain these, um, like this is like a god's weapon what for what reason did perforos gift you this weapon i don't know then we have dekela the bident of thassa first of all this is the first time i've ever actually seen bident as a word i know it exists right if trident exists and quadent could theory in a theory you know essentially exist uh, and I guess a bident is two-pronged, and I guess you just have a spear for a unident would just be a spear. But yeah, I've never heard the term bident, so this was a, like a little chuckle out of me. Um, bident of the Deep as a plus three trident. See, it acts as a trident. I feel like it should have its own unique stat block because it's a bident. But anyway, um, when you hit with an attack with it, it deals an extra 2d10 cold damage. And you'll see they kind of all have the same thing, right? They do a plus three weapon, they deal extra damage. They have a piety section where you're going to get some different things. So it's not the same though. For this one, for piety 10 plus, you gain a uh, you can breathe underwater in a swim speed of 60 feet. 25 plus is a minor beneficial property, randomly determined. 50 plus a randomly determined a major beneficial property. If you aren't a worshiper of Thassa, you get uh, it has one minor detrimental property and one major detrimental property. Um, if you hold it as an action, you can change the condition of the sea within one mile of you, creating strong winds and heavy rains that cause violent waves or a calming storm. 
In either case, the unnatural weather lasts for one hour before returning to normal. Once you do this, you can't do it again until the next dusk. Additionally, you can cast Dominate Monster with a save DC of 18 on beasts and monstrosities that have an innate swim speed. So it's like a tried in a fish command, but like seriously jacked up. That's also once until the next dusk. Um, you can also cast True Polymorph with a save DC of 18 from the Bident, but you must cast it on a creature to turn it into a kind of creature that has an innate swim speed. Once used, this property of the Bident can't be used again until the next dusk. To destroy it, it must be heated by the breath of an ancient red dragon and then while still hot, immersed in the Tartix River. I wonder if that's like the river Styx. Um... A reminder that true polymorph is got where there's that thing I think where is it? Um, I thought true polymorph had something or maybe that's shape change where if you stay in that form for too long, uh, you can become that one forever. Is that true polymorph? Um, creature to creature. Let's see. Uh, hit points of the new form. You concentrate on the spell for the full duration. The spell lasts until it is dispelled. Um, yeah. So in theory, this is very godlike, very, you know, Greek mythology, like where you could turn somebody into like a fish. And like in theory, they're a fish forever if you concentrate on it for the full hour, which could be interesting. Uh, Aphixis, the bow of Nylia. Nice to see a bow get some love here. Bow of the Wild. This is a plus three short bow and a quiver with, so it's both the bow and the quiver with four arrows. Each one is tied to the four seasons. I also love the lore behind this. Um... Plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls with the bow and suffer no disadvantage when attacking at the weapon's long range and it crits on a 19 or 20. If you are a worshiper of, of Nylia, you have one major uh, randomly determined minor beneficial property at piety 10 plus. Uh, the bow has one randomly determined uh, major beneficial property at 25 plus and then nothing for 50 plus for some reason. Um... I don't know if that's a typo or they just decided that she doesn't get a 50 plus uh, piety benefit to her weapon. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, if you aren't a worshiper, you get one randomly determined major detrimental property. Um, arrows of the seasons, as we discussed, right? So each arrow disperses immediately after it's used. It reappears in the quiver at the next dusk. And if it has a spell save DC, um, the spell save DC is 18. So the spring arrow, uh, as an action, you fire the arrow to target a beast or plant within 320 feet. It deals no damage, but the target gains the benefit of the awaken spell for eight hours. The summer one, um, as an action, you fire it at a space on the ground you can see within 320 feet with no attack roll required. A Nyxborn lynx, which is a creature we'll talk about coming up, is summoned in its space using the stat block for a tiger with the Nyxborn traits from chapter six of this book. Um, the lynx understands your verbal commands and obeys them as best it can. It takes its turn immediately after yours. It fades away after an hour. The autumn one uh, chooses space within 320 feet and cast Wall of Thorns there. And the winter one chooses space within 320 feet and cast the Ice Storm spell there. Um, it can't be destroyed without first destroying all of its arrows. The winter arrow must be fed to Cerberus on the winter solstice. The spring arrow must be planted at the base of a black oak of Asphodel on the spring equinox. The summer arrow must be broken by a sea giant on the summer solstice. Then the autumn arrow must be shot into the carcass of a hydra on the autumnal equinox. When all four arrows are, de arrows are destroyed, the bow and quiver dissolve into dust. We have Crusor, the Spear of Heliod. Um... This is a Spear of the Sun. It's plus three to attack and damage. And when you hit with it, they take an extra 2d8 uh, radiant damage. See, we've got... Now, this one, interestingly enough, gets a piety score of three plus if you're a worshiper. 15 temporary hit points each day at dawn. Uh, piety of 10 plus is a randomly determined minor beneficial property. Uh, 25 plus is an additional minor beneficial property. And 50 plus is a major beneficial property. So maybe Nylia just doesn't get anything better than that. I don't know. I guess maybe that is by design. Um, if you aren't a worshiper of Heliod, you get two randomly determined major detrimental properties. It sheds light in a 30 foot radius and an additional dim light in another 30 feet. It is sunlight. Uh, whenever you take damage from a creature within five feet of you, you can use your reaction to make a melee attack with the spear against that creature. On a hit, the spear deals damage as normal, and the creature is blinded until the start of its next turn. Once on, uh, can't be used again until the next dawn. 
Uh, it has 10 charges to cast spells. You can use an action to expend one or more charges to cast the following spells with a save DC of 18, Guiding Bolt for 1, Daylight for 3, targeting the tip of the spear only, or Sunbeam for 6, getting a D6 plus 4 back at dawn. And to destroy it, it must be taken to Erebos' place in Tizarus and used to sacrifice a champion of Heliod to Erebos. Crusor is either immediate is either destroyed or fundamentally twisted to Erebos' service. That's really cool. So it doesn't necessarily just destroy it, it could turn it to a weapon. I guess of evil for the the antithesis i guess that's erebos speaking of the final thing is mass discs the whip of erebos well funny i was just mentioning magic whips in the last video um whip of the dead this is a whip with enervating energy of the underworld plus three to attack and damage rolls when you hit with an attack using this whip the target takes an extra 2d8 necrotic damage and you regain hit points equal to half the amount of necrotic damage dealt very cool Additionally, when you make an attack with the whip on your turn, you can increase the range of the attack to 300 feet. What? Oh, the whip, the property can't be used until the next one. That's bananas, but that's like in every video game or anime where someone has a whip. It just seemingly has unlimited range when it needs to. That I think is too funny. Um, if you're a worshiper of Erebos, you gain the following benefits based on your piety. Only one plus piety, a minor detrimental property, a burden of Erebos imposed to test his faithful. That's actually very thematic. I like that. Uh, 25 plus a major beneficial property and 50 plus an additional major beneficial property. Uh, if you aren't a worshiper, it comes with two randomly determined major detrimental properties and then Erebos's claim. While carrying the whip, you can use an action to either cast Circle of Death or Dominate Monster, targeting only undead from the whip, DC 18. I uh, can't do it again until the next dusk. And to destroy the whip, it must be taken to the heights of Mount Hyostos in Nyx, unraveled by a returned and left to bask in a continual daylight for one month. I'm going to guess that's sort of like um, Olympus or the Elysian Fields. Basically, you got to take it to the antithesis of the underworld. Um, either way, that's awesome. That makes me want to make a cool magic whip. I feel like I'm going to and add it into one of my games. Um, I do that often, actually. I add in cool magic whips, and nobody ever uses them. I guess I'm just the biggest Castlevania fan in any of the D&D games that I run, and nobody else wants to be the whip guy or gal. Uh, and it just bugs me, because I'll come up with a really badass. I had, like, a whip that was made out of lightning. I was really pumped about that, and nobody used it. They just sold it. it was bummer Anyway, that's it for the magic items. Uh, again, there was a couple things that were mentioned, like different creatures and there was sort of the uh the golden fleece type item uh mentioned but that's more tied to the creature itself so we'll talk about that um when we get into the monsters which should be the next video uh, i'll just say buckle up for that one it will be longer right there are a lot of monsters in this book so um which is a good thing uh so just keep that in mind anyway thank you again so much for watching thank you to my patrons over on patreon for continuing to support the channel and if you haven't subscribed, well, I would appreciate it if you did so. It does help me out. Uh, just in case you're wondering, flat subscriber numbers does not equal, you know, cash for the YouTuber. That's just not how that works. It just helps the channel grow, helps get it in front of more people's eyeballs. And it makes me feel good to see that number go up. And like I said, if I could get 50K by my birthday on the 12th of July, well, that would be a pretty badass birthday present from all of you to me. And the giveaway that I will do for that, oh, just you wait. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.